I had asked my team yesterday, you know, okay, the year's coming to a close. How did we do? We introduced 46 bipartisan bills this this Congress. Um, we had enacted into law eight bills, uh, ten if you include two bills on the worker retraining front and on the human trafficking front, where the majority of our legislation uh, got into legislation that was signed into law by the president. And then two of our bills were uh, done by executive action. That's happening more and more. So, you know, that's basically the role of Congress. You, 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 you draft legislation, the president just decides to implement it. And uh, forget that Congress. Uh, but we have been relatively productive in a, in a dysfunctional system, and we'll continue to do what we can regardless of what happens in the elections. But I will tell you, since Councilman asked me to talk about this, I do think there's a very good possibility that you'll see a shift in the majority in the Senate. Uh, I'm certainly not promising it. And, uh, you know, this is a good Republican group, evidenced by Amber introducing me. Uh, I've been trying to convert her for years, so finally, rip on no. Um, but I, I will tell you, as, as fellow Republicans here, because uh, some of you are anyway, I think a couple, oh, but, uh, you know, I, I think there's a, there's a very good possibility for one simple reason, and that is we have taken the time to recruit the right people and to encourage them to focus on the right issues. So we've done it differently this year. I'm the chair of the fundraising effort, as you know, but I spent my first few months recruiting, and that has paid off. So we have great candidates around the country. And I think it's the best slate of candidates, certainly I've seen in, in modern times. And at the end of the day, in these last 42 days, six hours, 32 minutes, 16 seconds, I can't wait for this to be over, um, I think you'll see that the quality of the candidates make the difference. And so I think there's a, there's a good shot. Uh, however, I will tell you, there are six races that are just uh, on the nice edge. They could go either way. And those will determine the future of the Senate, and not to be too grandiose about it this morning, but I think the future of our country in the sense that I think if we got a Republican majority, it would change things. Um, I'm naive enough to think that President Obama would actually come to the table and help us work on some of these issues. I mentioned trade and tax earlier. Those are obviously two areas where we need something to move urgently, and I think the President would work with us. Uh, he's for TPA. He'd like to do uh, things a little differently than Republicans would like to in some respects, but I think we can get that done, and I think on taxes, there's a very good opportunity for us to do tax reform. Most think I'm crazy about doing that because it's always a better argument to say, well, let's wait until, let's wait until, in this case, some Republicans might say, let's wait until 2017 when we have the House and the Senate and a Republican president. I remind my colleagues when they tell me that, not to be a downer this morning for my fellow Republicans, but the Democrats have seven seats up this year that Mitt Romney won, which is why the playing field is very favorable to us. So thank Arkansas and Louisiana and North Carolina and West Virginia and Montana and South Dakota and Alaska. Uh, what is the number in 2016? Anybody tell me how many Republicans are going to be up in seats that Barack Obama won at least once? Nine. I hear nine. nine. Do I hear another number? Nine. It's ten. Ten. It's ten. You've got to include Iowa. You're not that Iowa. Uh, ten seats. And Democrats have nobody. And so, for those Republicans who think, uh, let's just wait. <laughs> First, we can't wait. Uh, our, our country is in trouble, in my view, and it's not just internationally with ISIS and a deficit of leadership overseas, which I believe is true. I'm happy to talk more about that if, if you'd like to hear my views on it. But I think here at home, we, we, we're in trouble because of a leadership deficit, and we have to stand up and be counted. So, I, I would hope that, um, although it's always tempting to say, let's just wait, because these are hard things to do. And on tax reform, particularly comprehensive tax reform, where we're going to have a lot of debates over how much revenue needs to be raised. The President will want between $1 and $1.5 trillion new revenue. Republicans will want tax cuts. Um, but on the corporate side, where we could probably do something that's revenue neutral, although the administration has unfortunately changed the game a little there, and um, so the, the goalpost has been increased, uh, raised a little bit by saying now we have to kick off some, some revenue. But I think we, we have an opportunity there to do something probably more easily, given the fact that we're closer in terms of the consensus on broadening the base, lowering the rate, and, and doing it in a revenue neutral basis. Uh, but I think we've got to get busy on these things. The Rip On Forum, which of course I memorize every uh, quarter, right? Phew. Um, has an article coming out in the, in the next forum um, by a guy named David Winston. Some of you know David, the pollster who we've spoken to this group before. 
and uh, David's also an Ohioan and, and a good friend, and it makes a very simple point, um, maybe a little bit self-congratulatory because he was involved in it, but that the contract uh, with America worked. And it worked in the sense that it created this opportunity for Republicans to say what they were for, not just against, uh, but also provided a framework for success once they got the majority. And so I, I, I think it's a really interesting read. Um, for those of you who um, memorize the form like I do, I know you'll read it anyway. For others, pick it up. And in essence, I think that's the, the greatest challenge we face right now as, as a party. I think we'll do okay in these elections regardless. I, I think, in a way, the, the die is set. I wish we'd done more in terms of providing a contract with America type framework, although we've done some of that, including this, which is called Jobs for America. If you don't have one, let us know. We'll send you one. But it's a seven-point plan for economic growth and prosperity, and this is something that all 45 Republican senators have signed off on. From Ted Cruz, this is in college, which is saying a lot. Actually. <laughs> um, and uh, we worked on this uh, in our office, but spent a lot of time, four months, in fact, working with all the other offices. And so we've given this to all of our candidates. Many of them are using it. Um, I, I think it's the... It's the appropriate focus in the election this year, despite the increased interest on the international side, the interest in Obamacare, the interest in even some of the social issues among some. This focuses on the economic issues and the fiscal issues. And it does include uh, trade and tax reform, as you can imagine, um, but also health care and energy. Uh, international trade being one of my interests. There's a lot in there on that, but also on uh, worker retraining and education. Uh, De deficit reduction. Um, so it, it sort of hits all the, all the areas that Republicans, when we focus on them, tend to do pretty well because they're areas where most Americans tend to agree with us. So I'm hopeful that as we move forward, should we win this majority, that in those first 50 days, 100 days, six months, which will be the critical time period, uh, that we have an agenda ready to go. And I'm working on that right now, even as I travel the country, helping these candidates. I think I'm going to seven states in the next month, and maybe another seven that last week. Um, and um, we're doing fine in terms of the fundraising. We're going to have a record year for the NRSC uh, and a record cycle. But we're being outraised by the Democrats significantly. Uh, put note. Um, Democrats are really good at raising money these days. Uh, but ultimately, I think, you know, it is going to come down to whether our candidates, and they're good candidates, and therefore they are doing it, are for something. And if people look at them and say, you know, as frustrated as I am with Washington, Fox on both parties, this person, this woman, this man, actually sounds like he or she is interested in getting something done. And I, I do think that at the end of the day is going to be the deciding factor in many of these races. Even in these very red states where Republicans may think uh, that they can just be against uh, Obamacare and against the president on foreign policy and other issues because he's so unpopular. Think Arkansas or Louisiana. But I think ultimately these elections will be determined by what you're for and what you want to do to move the country forward. And then when we get elected, I hope people have that template in mind in the sense that you know they were elected to actually do something and then earn the confidence of those voters who, who gave them the ability uh, to serve so that we can get back to having this town function uh, the way it used to back when Nancy Johnson chaired the health subcommittee. Uh, we got a lot more done. So thank you all for having me here this morning. Love to get your questions or thoughts or comments on on the politics or the policy issues or anything else that's on your mind. Thank you. Amber, you get the first question since so she right. did such a stellar job introducing <coughs> Rob. So please. What do you see as the chances to get TPA done in Lame Duck, and how might the election affect that? Amber's question is about TPA, chance of getting it done in lame duck, and how will the election one way that are affected? Um, first of all, Perry Reed's already in a bad mood. And one of my concerns is that if we get the majority, you know, he'll be even in a worse mood. And um, he's not a big fan of TPA, as, as you know. Uh, but having said that, I, I do think if we get the majority, uh, even Harry Reed will realize, you know, we're going to move forward with it first year anyway. So maybe this is one where. Republicans and Democrats can work together to get something done. Uh, he, he and most Democrats care a lot about having TAA extension. This is the, the TAA expansion coming out of stimulus, really. 
And uh, I think there's a much better shot of that in lame duck than there would be next year. I support that. As to uh, last time I got a letter signed by, I think, seven Republicans in the context of getting the three trade agreements done, we had to make some assurances there. And uh, so I think we have enough Republicans in the current Congress to be able to get that done. So I think for Democrats, there's some incentives to do it in lame duck. I hope they will. Amber and I were talking about the timing. I always thought it'd be really difficult to do in a short lame duck. But uh, as she reminds me, there you know there is no TPA currently in existence. So it's not as though the time frame under TPA applies. So you could move uh, through regular order quickly and committee and, and get it to the floor as close as possible. I think if we had a vote in the Finance Committee tomorrow and we were able to get some tweaks, including the TAA tweak that uh, Chairman Wyden would like, and, and maybe one or two other things, if we could get four or five Democrats to support it, you're nodding your head, which is a good sign, because I have no idea, Amber knows. <laughs> but if you got all the Republicans and four or five Democrats supporting that committee, uh, you know, we can shoot like a rocket to the to the floor, we'd have a strong vote. And uh, then if you have to Harry Reid, and, and again, I'd have, you know, have to ask you all. Uh, it's hard to take his temperature sometimes for me. I can't, I can't quite figure out what he wants to do sometimes in terms of trade. But he, he seems to be personally against it, he'll vote no, but I would hope he'd let it to the floor. So that'd be a nice thing to get done. And I think it is possible. Most in the sound think it's impossible, as you know, so they're already preparing for what we'll do after the first of the year. And I do think that ought to be on the top of the Republican agenda. I have a question now about foreign policy. <clears throat> the authorization Congress gave to the President with respect to ISIS uh, was very narrow, simply to uh, allow the training of uh, moderate Syrian rebels to so that they could uh, fight basically on our side in this endeavor. Given the events in Syria last night, uh, which was apparently uh, quite uh, consequential, uh, do you think Congress is going to have a debate and a vote on a f bigger authorization in the lame duck session? And if not, does the president, in your view, have the power to do what he's doing now under the War Powers Act? Yeah, I, I would think in lame duck uh, there'll be an interest in taking up the issue and, and looking at a broader strategy. I mean, uh, I voted for the CR, and I voted for it in part because of some of the pieces we did get in the CR for a while, including for the Python plant. Some of you follow that issue, and the enrichment uranium plant. But also, I, I've said that I support the president in terms of providing some help to the Free Syrian Army. I've been calling for it for two years since I was over in the area. And, uh, you know, hard for me now to turn around and say two years later that's a bad idea, even though the reality is the Free Syrian Army is, is much weaker now than it was two years ago. But I think that was appropriate. But you're right, you know, going into, into Syria with the bombing campaign, I think, should uh, be something that the that Congress provides an additional authorization for, and I think the President would be wise to come to Congress. I think he was unwise to have expanded into Syria without requesting the authorization in the context of the of the CR, rather rather than just asking for the training authorization, which by the way he also needed because it went from we can now say this a covert to an overt program through that authorization. Uh, but we'll see. I mean, I I've been on both sides of Pennsylvania Avenue. I don't think the Commander in Chief needs to come to Congress uh, to respond to an imminent threat. I don't think he needs to come when it's a narrow scope. Uh, and this is a you know. We've got all sorts of lawyers here in the room. Um, this is a gray area, let's face it. The War Powers Act is a gray area itself. But I do think when you extend the conflict beyond Iraq, where there is an authorization in place um, into Syria, I think it's smart to get a new authorization. And in part, for legal reasons, and being sure you're clear as to you know what the presidential role is and what the Congress role is under the power to declare war. But more importantly, frankly, to me is let the lawyers argue that out is for the American people to have more stake in this and to have more buy-in. And that debate will be a healthy debate. And I think ultimately the president will prevail. I worked for President George H.W. Bush. It was, as was mentioned earlier by councilman, I did not appreciate that. It aged me. Um, I was in his uh, legislative job. I was the, the deputy. He was, the title was Director of Legislative Affairs for uh, Bush 41. And I was very involved in the authorization for the use of force uh, in Desert Storm. And you recall, uh, this was an incredibly successful military operation. This was the PAL doctrine in, in place. I think we had 400,000 troops over there at one time, and 43 countries involved. We had Egyptian tanks on the front lines, and it was, a, it was incredible, really, when you look back on it. 
by the way, 43 compared to, I don't know how many countries are now involved in this latest coalition, but it might be 13. Um, and you don't see addition tanks on the front lines. But anyway, that was, I think most would say, an incredibly successful operation to push Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait, liberate Kuwait. We came within three votes of losing that authorization. When Sam Nunn decided to come out against it, it made it very difficult. And so I was in the Oval Office and in meetings in the cabinet room where President Bush 41 had to ponder this issue. You know, did he have the authority to do this? And um, I will just tell you that um, after the fact, that um, if he had not gotten the authorization, and we all worked very hard in the hill to get that, um, I think he would have gone ahead anyway. And because he believed that this was an imminent threat, because he believed, maybe from his World War II experience, you know, this shall not stand. And at the end of the day, um, it would have been less successful from a domestic point of view. He would have had the same success as militarily, uh, because the American people wouldn't, wouldn't have been with him uh, to the extent that they were. There would have been a real division. But uh, he was prepared to, prepared to do it. And in his role as commander-in-chief, one could argue he had the ability to do it. Uh, others would say he, he did not. So, anyway, the answer to your question is yes, he ought to come to Congress for additional authorization, and I hope he will. What do you uh, following on on that question, um, you know, the idea that we know who these people are in Syria is doubtful. Um, and what do you think needs to be congressional oversight about exactly who we are in there and make sure that we are not creating another Assad? Yeah, one of his question is who are these? Free Syrian army folks or other so-called moderate elements. Um, how do you properly vet them to ensure that you're not providing arms to people who later use them against us, or even that they fall into the wrong hands? You know, once you vet these folks, and it's it's a, it's a hard one. I, I I acknowledge that, and part of the reason that you go through this two three year process that people are are understandably complaining about why does it take so long is that you don't just provide the weapons, you provide the training. And the training is not just, you know, how do you pull the trigger and hit the target? It's, uh, you know, how do you have a command and control structure that makes sense? How do you, you know, go through the all the processes of, of teaching soldiers how to be soldiers that work, you know, appropriately with the civilian population and so on? So the whole notion is you you create uh, a, a more a higher likelihood that they'll be successful and a less uh, lower likelihood that they're going to be doing what the Iraqi army is doing with many of our arms, which is, as they just did this week, when they were surrounded, throw down their arms and run away and provide the arms, in this case, to ISIS. So I think it is a long process and it's painful, but uh, I think you do have to have that process. Should Congress do oversight? Of course. Uh, but, you know, in answer to the question about the use of force, uh, having 535 secretaries of state and secretaries of the Army and secretaries of whatever uh, doesn't work, and I think you've got to trust at some point the career professionals, and uh, that's one reason I believe the Commander-in-Chief has certain in inherent powers uh, that should not devolve to Congress because we'll probably mess it up. Yeah. Rob, uh, going marrying the two issues, one of the things is U.S. companies in the competitive arena uh, have a tremendous, you know, difficulty. But we're having, actually, with our own government, as well as the taxpayer money, whether it's World Bank, whether it's the UN, but even USAID, American companies are discriminated against. Most US companies cannot get their products, contracts, with places like USAID or the UN, yet we fund the UN with donor money about seven or 42 percent. USAID, all U.S. taxpayer money, World Bank. How does Congress marry that, those two issues on the foreign policy and on our competitive, when our own government will not utilize U.S. products? Please see Rob Lehman on that one. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's, it's frustrating, and, uh, you know, people think USDR had uh, a primary role of, uh, you know, negotiating trade agreements, and it's true, but actually our, our larger role probably was, you know, helping U.S. companies who were being unfairly treated. Um, 
not against the United States government, but against foreign 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 companies. And uh, so I, I I think you make a good point. I will say with regard to AID, um, and I come from a big ag state, you know, and I certainly support our our programs in terms of providing food aid. But uh, when you're growing the soybeans or corn here, and you're shipping it over there, and when there is an alternative, which there is in many cases, to grow the product in that country and to actually provide some economic benefits to that country, that's one place where you and I might agree or might disagree, but I do think there are some programs that AID does that, uh, while it's taxpayer money, it's not being very efficiently uh, utilized, you know what I mean? So I, I'm, when I was um, at USCR, I was also on the Millennium Challenge Board and uh, got into this issue a little bit where, uh, again, our food aid program is incredibly important. But if you can get these countries that are developing countries to produce their own food, it creates jobs and economic opportunity going, going forward. Uh, and, that, and that's probably a better use of our expertise and, and our funds. But I agree, with your, I agree with, your, with your point with that, with that exception with regard to AID. Last question. Uh, it's tough being the tax counsel in a room with a lot of really important issues. <laughs> but could you comment on the... Restrain yourself if you can. <laughs> <laughs> could you comment on, on the plan for extenders? Yeah. First of all, M McCarthy um, announced today that he is not retiring from Procter & Gamble. <laughs> uh, Yay! <laughs> he has five, five more days uh, where he's fully vested in the Procter & Gamble profit sharing plan, and uh, he's going to continue to work with them and with, with us, which I was really pleased to hear. So congratulations on your quasi-retirement. And I'm glad you decided not to really retire. Yeah, I think Extenders uh, gets done. I think it's kicking the can down the road again. Uh, I, I think it's very hard to see us doing anything serious in lame duck on Extenders, and I think probably we're end up with some compromise between the two houses. I don't know what that means, but maybe it's R&D is made permanent, and, and maybe that's the that's the give, and then there's a two-year bill. If there's not a two-year bill, you know, yeah. you're kicking the can down the road about a month, because you know, many of these provisions expired at the end of last year, so you've got I mean, two years really closer to one year and, and a month or so. So I think that's where you, where you end up. And then it gets folded into tax reform. And I, you know, I do think it helps in terms of uh, tax reform. It provides a little more space. The, it, it helps in terms of the baseline. Uh, so I've, you know, I've gone to my fellow Republicans who again say, let's just wait and do this when we take over. Well, it actually helps us do what we want to do. And uh, I know there's going to be uh, national teeth and and a lot of debate over production tax credit and some other issues, but I just I, I think it's at this point better for us to move it forward um, and to actually do the important work of tax reform, which will make I hope the good extenders permanent and uh, you know get rid of the rest of them along with a lot of the preferences in the code, which I know makes everybody nervous. But if you have a low enough rate and you can hold that rate, it's going to be good for most of the companies represented in this room, and it's going to be great for the economy, and that's ultimately good for all of us. So I hope we'll stick together on that as a, as a, as a team, those of us who believe in pro-growth fiscal and economic policy to say, we've got to take this antiquated tax code and reform it. And by the way, I was too generous uh, to Congress on using 1984 as my example, because that was when the rate was lowered to 34%, but the international tax system goes back to the 60s, the 1960s, 1962. And uh, who was playing for the Reds in 1962? I mean, Beta Pinson. Beta Pinson. <laughs> who said that? That's right. Frank Robinson. He's my grandmother's favorite player. Yeah. <laughs> that really ages you. <laughs> yeah. So on that note, um, thank you all. It's great to see everybody. Seriously, stay in touch with us.